Wonderful, wonderful. Good to see you here tonight. We'll get started. So glad you are all, all are here. Trust you've had a good day. Let's sing Joy Unspeakable. If you need the book, it's 167 in the church hymnal, 167. And uh, you want to stand? Let's all stand. We'll sing the first, second, and last. 167, Joy Unspeakable. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. So good to see you here tonight. My, it's so good to see all of you here tonight. Good to have our friends, the Gideons, here tonight. Amen. They're in town. And Brother Ronnie Kent's here all the way from Alabama. Brother Charles Frady, always good to see these gentlemen. I love them, appreciate them, the ministry they're involved in. And uh, looking forward to Gideon Sunday this coming Sunday. And uh, we'll have a speaker here. And uh, I'm excited about that here and about the work of the Lord through the Gideons. Amen. Good to see Brother Reggie and Sister Veronica back there. Amen. Always good to see them and all of you, all the rest of you. Boy, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it tonight. So good to see all of you here in the house of the Lord. Brother Charles, will you pray for us tonight and lead us to the throne of grace? Amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brother Charles. Amen. Well, I trust you've had a good day. It's been a beautiful day out there. Almost like summertime again. Don't get food, though. Summer's not coming back for several months yet, okay? Uh, them, them ladybugs are going to think so, and they're going to be popping out here in just a little bit, but uh, that's okay. They're going to get an awful surprise because cold weather's going to head back in before we know it. Amen. But uh, I'm thankful for these pretty days. I'm glad God's in control of the weather. I'm glad I'm not. Amen. Well, I'd be getting them phone calls. Man, what in the world's going on, preacher? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm not in control of the weather. Thank God I'm not. Amen. Turn it all over to him and just rest in his control. That's wonderful that we can do that. It certainly is. Don't forget Sunday, of course, Sunday school. 10 o'clock, regular worship service at 11. Looking forward to uh, Sunday service and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us. And then, of course, Sunday evening, don't forget that, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, our evening worship service. Don't forget that as well. Other things coming up, Thanksgiving. Have our Thanksgiving week, our Thanksgiving get-together that week. The week of Thanksgiving, we'll meet on Tuesday. We'll be out in the fellowship hall on Tuesday and have our fellowship uh, time together, food and fellowship together. It's in the bulletin. You'll be hearing more about it. 
of course, in the next few services, and I'm excited about that. It's always a good, joyful time for us to be together Thanksgiving week. Amen. My son from Portland, Oregon will be here, and Sister Karen's grandbaby will be here. have to say it that way. Uh, I was watching a video. I had her on video call the other night. He called me Sunday night, and we were talking, and uh, I said, where's that girl? He flipped it around, and she had on a Georgia shirt, brother, a Georgia dress. Had a big G on it. I said, Lord, there's Papa Jay's Georgia girl. She said, big old smile swelled up so big. I thought, boy, this is great. She said, I met a Georgia girl. <laughs> I said, oh, boy, I can't wait for Lucy. She is Nana's girl, and I'm glad she is. She's a sweet girl. I'm looking forward to seeing all of them, and the Lord willing, they'll be here in just a few days. We're excited about that. If you have your Bibles with you, open them to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, looking in the Word of God. I was thinking about what I preached on last Wednesday night. If you, if you just keep serving the Lord. If you stay with him, that's what I preached on last Wednesday night. If you just stay with the Lord, if you keep trusting him, keep serving him, keep believing and keep your faith in him as Abraham and Sarah did, we talked about their life and what happened. And tonight I want to talk a little bit toward that subject, a little different. And uh, tonight I'm going to preach on a different, uh, a little bit different subject from these scriptures but uh, it's one of Paul's faithful sayings. He has four of them, faithful sayings. You read in the scriptures, you'll find where he says faithful saying four times. This is one of them in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, if you're able and can stand with me, we'll read these three verses together. And then I'll look at them for just a few minutes tonight and bring you what the Lord's laid on our hearts for this evening. The Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. What a powerful statement. Verse number 12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful he cannot deny himself. You can be seated. I want to look at these verses and draw out of them tonight uh, something that will help us, I believe, and encourage us in these days. You, you may not recognize this guy. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. It comes right out of the history books of America. You know him? Of course you do. All you history buffs and all you history scholars, you know this person right here. This is, of course, uh, Captain James Lawrence. You knew exactly who that was, didn't you? Of course you do. He, he uh, of course, uh, was a great seaman, and he served our country uh, for many years, and, of course, he was a, a man who was noble. Uh, isn't known for a lot of things. Only lived to 31 years and then passed away. But what he's most noted for is that theme on the right there, of what he said. James was born, of course, in uh, 1781. He died during the War of 1812. He commanded the USS Chesapeake. And uh, in that war, in that battle there in Boston, he's known for these war, known for these words during the War of 1812. He was promoted to captain over a 38-gun ship, the USS Chesapeake, with only a crew of 300 men. And it was during that uh, quick battle, not, not after being ranked and taking over that ship very long, that he found himself in a heated battle and engulfed with a British ship, the Shannon, just outside the Boston Harbor. And the cap was mortally wounded. They carried him down into the, to the hull of the, of the ship for treatment. And as he was being carried down, mortally wounded, he cried out to the men, his call to them as they're carrying him down as he's going to die. He said these words, tell the men to fire faster. Tell the men to fire faster and don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship. Fire 
her till she sinks, is what he said. Don't give up the ship. Uh, later, that he was remembered in life for those words. Those five words, don't give up the ship. We have in our country right now over 24 cities and counties, townships, named after him. Captain James Lawrence. Lawrenceville, Georgia, in our town, in our uh, Georgia, state of Georgia, is named after him. There are many other counties and townships and cities that are named after him. There are over five naval ships named after him, the USS Lawrence, named after him, simply because it was his battle cry. Now, he didn't have a good beginning. When he was born, I was reading his history, when he was born, uh, his, uh, his parents, his mother died when he was an infant. His father, a loyalist to Canada, took off back to Canada. So he was left uh, here with his half-sister to care for him, and he just continued in his education, joined the Navy, got involved in the Navy, and remained loyal to the United States. And at the age of 31, he became captain and died just a few months later. But he had that motto, don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship. So I don't want to look at these verses. Paul is writing this young man, Timothy. It's believed to be his last letter, 2 Timothy. And I want to use this thought tonight with just these three verses to keep us going. To keep us going. Going is better. Going is better than quitting. Going is better than stopping. Going is better. To keep us going. What did Paul say to this young man, Timothy? It's found right here in these three verses. There's three things found right here in these three verses. I believe that will help us keep going. Don't give up the ship. Don't quit. Don't give in. And I believe, of course, Paul is writing to them. Hey, everybody from time to time get wounded in the war of life. I guess you can say it that way. Or sometimes we get cuts and bruises. Sometimes they're pretty serious. And many times in the heat of the battle, for whatever reason, sometimes we are tempted, of course, and give it up. And, of course, we consider sometimes even the strongest people consider uh, sitting down or quitting. And to keep us going or going on, Paul writes this young man, Timothy. Now, you've got to remember where Paul is. He's locked up in that prison, in that dungeon and he's chained to a guard at this time. It's not on easy leave now. He's facing his last days. Matter of fact, earlier in this second letter he's wrote to Timothy, he says, they're treating me like an evildoer. My life hasn't changed, but they're treating me like I'm some evildoer, like I'm some known criminal. He's chained to a guard, literally like a criminal. It won't be long before Nero's guard comes and they'll take him out of his cell, out of that dungeon down below the street level. They'll take him out and they'll execute him as an enemy of the state. They'll cut his head off. If anybody might have felt like giving up, it should have been Paul. He knows what's coming. He, he, uh, he's done all these other things, but yet he finds the time on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write this encouraging letter to this young man, Timothy. And he's going to write for him to come, but he's also going to write these words to keep him going and to keep us going and to help us because the Holy Spirit had him write some things to help us in these days, in this second uh, chapter of the second letter, we find one of these faithful sayings that Paul talks about, four of them. This one appears to be in the form of somewhat of a poem or maybe in a stanza. He's trying to write it to this young man, Timothy, and he's writing. Uh, it's a trustworthy truth, he's saying. It's a faithful saying. It's something you ought to hang on to, Paul. Uh, Timothy, I'm writing to you. Paul's writing to him, and he's writing to us. Paul's writing to us. Something we can hang on to in difficult times. When you feel like laying down more than standing up, when you feel like uh, fainting more than fighting, he says, I want to encourage you, and it's right here in these verses, these three verses. What are they? 
He says we ought to keep going, that uh, keep us going, to keep going us going on, and what we have to keep us going. He says the first thing right there in verse number 11 is we have a relationship to Christ. You see it right there in verse number 11. Don't ever forget about your relationship to Jesus Christ. Sometimes we let a uh, get a little lax in that relationship. We let that relationship get a little lax, don't we? But Paul here writes, Paul wasn't the only one in a tough place. Apparently, Timothy was in some trouble too. How do you know that, preacher? Because of what he said, the way he opens this letter, what he says to him. You go back and look in the first part of this letter. I didn't, I didn't uh, put them all in the PowerPoint, but you can go back and look at it. He writes, of course, in what he wrote in his first letter. He talks about him being a, a strong man. Be strong in the Lord, he talks about. Evidently, Timothy was going through some hard times. He needed him to endure. He needed him to be strong. Endure hardness as a good soldier, he talked about. He, he said, you're, you're going to have some tough times. You and I have tough times in life. He won't encourage Timothy in his own struggles. In verse number 8, he instructed him, to uh, remember that Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel he talks about. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, he said in verse number 8 of chapter number 1. He said, don't be ashamed of those things, Timothy. Stand up right, man. The relationship was for us to keep going rather than stopping. In these days in which you and I live where it's not becoming more and more, it's not popular to be a devout Christian. Now, you can be a part-time Christian, you'll be okay. You can go along with the crowd, you'll be okay. Don't say nothing about the sins of our society, you'll be all right. But if you be a strong soldier for Christ, it won't be easy. People will shun you. People won't like what you say or what you stand for. Instead of this relationship that Paul mentions here, look at it, verse number 11. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. You notice what he says there? Twice in that verse, he uses two words talking about our relationship. He says, with him. We're with him. Are you with him? Oh, my. Now, that's the more, uh, if I'd say it in a, I guess in a way we can relate that's the million-dollar question, the most important factor. Are we with him? Hmm. See, that's the relation point, with him. Uh, Karen used to go visit with me some. Now I, I don't wait on her. Used to. I say, you with me, baby? And I look back, she's way back there, and she said, I will be if you won't walk so fast. I'm always in a hurry. Sometimes I think I get that way with God. Huh? I'm outrunning him sometime or not in step with him. You know what I'm saying? Here Paul talks about with him. He talks about a past relationship. You notice that in the first phrase? If we be dead with him. That's the past relationship. Literally the idea is if we did die with him what Paul's relating to. He's talking about the Lord's death. He's what he's literally talking about. If we be dead with him, he's talking about when he died. Paul's talking about the day that Jesus died on the cross. Now, for us, that took, took place over 2,000 years ago. For Paul, it wasn't quite 2,000 years ago, but he's talking about that place of the skull. He's talking about the place where the Lord Jesus gave his life on that cross. Of course, none of us are alive but Paul was alive, I believe, when all that happened. He's talking about to Paul. He's, he's talking about this young man, Timothy. He's trying to relate to him. And the answer was when Jesus died, you see. He's talking about what happened. Remember what happened to you and I when Jesus died, Timothy. Remember what, how it relates to us. You see, he died the death that belonged to you and I. He used to sing that old song many years ago. I should have been crucified. Gordon Jensen wrote that song many years ago. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on that cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. You see, it was us who should have been on that cross. The Old Testament book of Leviticus 
When the animals who were brought into the temple there to be sacrificed, the priest would put his hands on the head of that animal and confess the sins of the people and then offer them as a sacrifice. He was rolling that sin debt forward, you see. The animal would die, be put to death instead of those people, that person. He's taking their place. Confession of the sins on that animal. Christ's death on the cross is the fulfillment of that Old Testament practice. As the believer, you and I have by faith placed our hands, what? On Christ. It was us who put him on that cross. It was our sins, not his sins. He was without sin. Who knew no sin? Yet he became sin for you and I. And we could be become righteousness. He became my substitute. Paul saying here that we died. He died for me, so I died with him. When I accepted his payment for my sin, I recognized the fact that he died in my stead. The worst possible death he could face that ever could be faced because he was totally innocent. Dying for the guilty. But he talks about a past relationship, but then he talks about a present relationship. Look at it, verse number 11. He says, it's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. He takes us from the past to the present. My identification relationship with Jesus doesn't stop with his death. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm glad. Hallelujah, boy. That's a shouting ground right there. He got up on the third day, walked out of that tomb, and because he did, he's still alive today, and he put death to death. Hallelujah. Ain't that wonderful? And his life is my life. That's the reason Paul could say Galatians chapter 2, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, you see, he gave his life for me. We often talk about giving our lives to Jesus. And it is a commitment from us to give ourselves to him. In reality, he gives us life. I was dead in trespasses and sin. Could not save myself. He came to where I was and brought life to me. You see, the new life is not the same that you lived before you were saved. You're not really even alive until you get saved. Don't even know how to live till you get saved. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, your new life is actually his life. And when you live by his power, you let him live through you. Oh, that's how you have the victorious life. Oh, we sing that old song, because he lives. He's, he's ever living to make intercession for us, the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He used to play with my boys. Now I play with my grandkids. Sometimes we play Dead man, you know, now I play dead girl or dead, you know, whatever these girls. I'm learning about girls now. They don't play as much as uh, dead people as much as them boys used to. But sometimes they shoot you, you know, and you fall over dead. Oh, I'm dead and you can't move, you know. Sometimes your tongue be hanging out, you know, all dead. Uh-huh. Uh, you done that? I've done that sometime. If you believe upon the Lord, that's where you are. You're dead in him. But he brings you to life and you let him live through you and in you. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. He lives through me and in me. Hallelujah. And a look at this faithful saying, we find our relationship to Christ. Our relationship in Christ. And then not only that, but look at this. This ought to help us keep going. With not only our relationship to Christ, but we will reign with Christ. Now look at verse number 12. He said, if we suffer, we also shall reign with him. That's encouraging. That's encouraging to Timothy. That's encouraging to Paul. The Holy Spirit reminds him of this very factor to encourage young Timothy with and to encourage you and I. He's looking back at the cross. He's looking back at that empty tomb. And he's looking forward one day to the crowning days. You'll talk about it later in this letter. He's going to talk about the crowning day. I said something about that Sunday morning. One of those crowns. As believers and followers of Christ, we don't give up this life primarily because we're going to, we're going to a life that's coming. In that coming life, God's got a plan for us. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. 
Somebody said it this way, Jesus is training his people to be kings and queens of the cosmos. What about that? He is training us to reign with him one day. The Bible talks about it. It's a, it's a reign, you see. The reign he talks about, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. That's right there in the word of God. That word suffer is an interesting word. Uh, it talks about enduring. It's talking about get, not, not falling under the pressure. Having the patience to continue on. Carries with it a holding one's ground, holding fast, standing firm, not giving in, not wavering. The Bible nowhere says that the Christian people will have to face any trauma or trouble without him. He's with us. Hmm. You see, the Bible talks about our suffering. Didn't say we'd have an easy life. A lot of people preach that, though. Hope you're right with God and will God. You know, you don't have all that. That's a lie of the pits of hell. Some of the greatest Christians we've ever known walked by faith. They endured suffering. The Bible gives us stories of them. The Bible gives us the accounts of their life while upon this earth. They endured suffering. It's part of life. Truth is, we're not ready to reign with him till we've suffered with him, suffered for him. Bible teach, God's people are called to suffer with patience and faith, to endure. What makes us think that we're part of the kingdom without learning to suffer a bit? Philippians chapter 1, verse number 29, For unto you it is given in your behalf, or in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians 1, 29. Here in America, though, boy, we've been, uh, hmm, we've been petted, pampered, and oh my, boy, I'm telling you, we're, in the Christian life, watch this now. We, we live in the amusement park Christianity. How you know that, preacher? Well, you don't do it like I want you to do it. I'll go to another amusement park. I'll where that, do it like I like it. Oh, my. Hmm? See, following Christ, for some people, is just a joy ride. Oh, me. Just a joy ride. What can I get out of it? A free ride. What can I have out of Christ? Jesus endured that while he was here. Crowd followed him for the miracles that he did till it come down to what? What he started preaching to them about their lives and what they would endure and the hard sayings, and they followed him no more. Hmm. He turned to his disciples, will you also go away? Peter said it, John chapter 6. He said it, John chapter 12. He said it, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You're the one, Lord. Hmm. Don't miss this. Paul said, if we suffer, we shall reign. It's a promise. It's a promise. Rather than quitting, rather than giving up, if we patiently endure the suffering of this life, whether it's physical pain, whether it's material suffering, losses, uh, whether it's religious persecution, which we may see, if we continue to stay with the book, whatever it may be, we endure that. Paul said, he reminds us what the Holy Spirit's telling him to write down. We shall also reign, here it is again, with him. Oh my, with him. Staying with him. Oh, the kingdom which we will rule and reign is the kingdom of Christ. Not some mystical uh, facade out there. It's a real kingdom. Where he's going to rule and reign. The Bible promises on the day when Jesus will once again set up his nail scarred hands and reign upon this earth. He'll come. 
Well, he won't come like he did before as an humble infant. He'll never crucify him again. Oh, no. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords one day in all of his glory with righteousness and justice and peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 21. To him that overcometh, who I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. The story is told of this of uh, England's King George V. He had a little son named John. When John died, he was just a little child. But before he died, he and his father would play together in the palace. The guy that wrote this story, he said they would go to the throne room at Buckingham Palace. And when the king would take his seat on the throne, he would bend down forward and lift up his little son and set him beside him on the throne. On that same throne, beside him in the same throne, on the same throne. He said it delighted his boy so much. The pride of the little prince, they called him. The little prince kingdom one day God's going to let us rule and reign with him we have a relationship to Jesus we will reign with Jesus here's the last thing I'm done the response from Jesus you notice it here verses 12 and 13 he talks about a response he's following the words of this faithful saying it's like a formula he's given us he said we shall if we he says in these verses, if we, if we, he talks about it here. In these verses, he said, if we, for if we, if we, if we, in all three of these verses, he says that. And then he says, we shall. Man, the response of the Lord, we shall. It's a promise. From a negative to a positive, you see, he gives us a response. We shall. He gives us that response. If we deny him first, the negative, he will also deny us. Now, Jesus had already stated that, Matthew chapter 10, verse number 33. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him also shall I deny before my Father which is in heaven. God wants us to stand with him. Not be ashamed of him. Mm. Some folks claim Jesus and uh, claim they belong to him until they face the challenges. Mm. They face the challenges of following him. They denounce him, renounce him. Uh, one of the terms the Bible uses for them is apostates. Hmm. Makes it clear. They weren't followers at all. They was impersonators. And before you say, no, 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 I would never, oh my. Paul's writing this from a prison cell. He's writing this young man, Timothy. He's been branded as a criminal himself. The world's looking on him as, as a hostile criminal. Facing a day when they would cut his head off for the cause of Christ. Think about it. He's not the only one. Millions have suffered down through the ages for the cause of Christ. And in this last century, we've seen more and more Christians. Unbetold Christians now. And this Muslim influence, more and more are being killed, slaughtered. In the name of Christ. And yet in our own country, people are marching to defend that very thing. Some of them ignorantly, but some of them willingly, knowingly. Don't care. Hmm. Millions name the name of Christ and suffer martyrdom for the name of Jesus Christ. Millions have been persecuted for his name's sake. Jesus knew 
that following him would not always be easy. He knew it wouldn't always be easy. He knew that there would be many that would face a sword for his sake, beheading for his sake, death for his sake. He knew that some who loved their own lives more than they loved his name would deny him. So before you say quickly, I'd never deny him, let us say, God, by God's grace. Hmm. Oh, my. By God's grace. If you're not so sure the sword wouldn't shake you, watch this now. Oh, I, 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 you know, I'd give my life, preacher. I wouldn't let a sword shake me from denying Christ. <laughs> I've known people give up Christ for a whole lot less. Think about it. Family tensions, financial struggles, physical pain. Hmm. Forsake Christ. Hmm. He talks about a faithful response, though. Here he says in verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. While some will go so far as denying their faith, renouncing him, disowning him, there will be others who in the midst of their suffering will, will believe, continue to trust. Maybe they lose sight of the cross or the empty tomb. Maybe they forget the value of suffering, the vision of the coming kingdom. Whatever the reason, there'll be some that will betray, believe not. He talks about here in verse number 13. Some, and I've known some, that in the physical limitations of the body, they've lost hope. Mary, and she come to that empty tomb on that resurrection Sunday, you remember? Think about this now. And she went running back to those disciples. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. And she told them, He's risen. The Lord is risen. And they, verse 11, when they heard, had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not still in disbelief they had to go look in the tomb themselves and still had disbelief I'm glad he abided faithful though he cannot deny himself Isn't that wonderful the promise is this faithfulness reaches beyond those points Samuel Rutherford the old Scottish preacher wrote this many years ago, many, many years ago. He said, often in my folly, listen to this, often in my folly, I have torn up my copy of God's covenant with me. But blessed be his name. He's kept his copy in heaven safe. And he still stands by it. Always. Hallelujah. He will not deny himself. And many times I haven't been faithful to him, but he's always been faithful to me. In the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our suffering, I don't know about all the Christian life stuff. I'm not even sure sometimes you get to the point, does Jesus even care? Oh, yes, he cares. You know he does, but sometimes you wonder. Oh, I'm glad he remains faithful. Even when we're not faithful, he still remains faithful. Hmm. You recognize this guy? Anybody know that guy? Who is that? <laughs> you know who he is? Mel Blank. You recognize him now? Oh, you know him. You know him. You know him well. You don't think you do, but you do. You've heard him so many times. You just never seen him. Mel Blank. 
the voice of Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, Tweety Bird, Sylvester the Cat, Elmer Fudd, Yosemite Sam, Foghorn Leghorn, Tasmanian Devil, the original voice of Woody Woodpecker, Cosmo Spacely of the Jetsons, Barney Rebel on the Flintstones, Heathcliff, and I could go on and on and on. He's known as the man of a thousand voices. He was born in San Francisco, California in 1908 to Jewish immigrants. He became a radio, uh, began his radio career as a voice actor at the age of 19 and continued that for over 60 years. He married his wife, Estelle Rosenbaum, and they were together for over 56 years until his death in 1989. They had one son named Noel Blank, also a voice actor. In 1961, Mel had a terrible, serious, head-on collision, automobile accident. He was in the hospital, terrible wreck, nearly killed him, in a coma for many days, bedridden for many weeks, flat of his back. When they woke him, trying to wake him out of the coma, they didn't know exactly how to do it. The neurologist there in California begin to try to work with him, and what they finally detected was to try to appeal to his conscious and subconscious. They said, Bugs Bunny, are you in there? And he said, what's up, Doc? Are you all right? And they said, is Tweety Bird in there? And he started responding to them. From that, he still was unable to get out of the bed. So for the first 65 episodes, when the Flintstones made their debut, Mel Blank recorded it from his bed with a microphone phone hanging over him. He refused to give up. He refused to give up. On his tombstone, it says, Mel Blank, the man of a thousand voices. And above that, he, uh, his dying wish was to put on his tombstone. That's all, folks. I don't know whether he's a saved man or not. I hope he was. But I do know this. Sometimes life will put you on your back. When you are, you might even feel like giving up or staying down. When you're there, you might even wonder what God is doing. Remember what Jesus has done. And our relationship to Christ one day will reign with him and that he responds that he is faithful even when we are not. He remains faithful to us. Let's pray together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe God's spoken to your heart tonight. Maybe you'd like to do business with the Lord. These altars are always open. While we wait a moment, give you an opportunity to pray. And then I'm going to pray. Let God do a work in your life. Maybe you felt like giving in, giving up. Allow this to keep you going. Relationship. One day will reign. Thank God he responds. God responds to our cries. He knows. He remembers that we are dust. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the reminder from Paul many years ago to this young man, Timothy, but yet through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit's reminder to us in these days, no matter what we're facing, to keep on going. You have the plan. You have the purpose. Lord, one day you're soon coming. Could be today. I'm glad. Lord, one day we'll reign with you. You'll help us to see the, the worth of what we're going through. It'll be worth it all one day. Thank you for what you're doing, what you're going to do in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.